Want to do better? Then it's time to change the story. Welcome to our show about new visions currently transforming the world through the confluence of art, tech, and innovation. And now your hosts, Michael Ashley and Neil Sahota. Hey, everybody. We want to introduce you to Jennifer Friend from the Project Hope Alliance. We are partnering with her, Neil and I, with Changing the Story. And we're very, very proud to be part of this, this project right now, now more than ever. We need your help. We need to help our children. And so we very much are excited to bring you Jennifer and the Project Hope Alliance and see that we can do great good in the world. Thank you. We're so grateful for this partnership. You know, in Orange County alone, there's over 28,000 children in our public education system experiencing homelessness. But we know that if we invest in our kids today, they won't be homeless tomorrow. Um, We've really seen that there is a $264 ROI for every $100 invested at Project Hope for our programming that we're doing with our homeless children and youth. Well, thank, thank you for all the hard work, Jennifer. And we're running a special, uh, I guess we'll call it a contest. We're going to try and raise money for Project Hope Alliance. Uh, there's a special page on our website. Check out the note below. And please participate and please donate of yourself. Time as well as your money is always appreciated. They're always looking for skills and any kind of help they can get. And it's a really worthy cause. So thank you for your help. Thank, thank you. you. Hey, welcome to another episode of Changing the Story. We've got a great guest on today, Dylan Watkins, the founder and CEO of Reality Smash, which is a VR and AR company. However, I have to kind of call out, knowing Dylan, he actually started off in the food truck space. He went true. on to uh, actually build out a uh, VR ecosystem and actually started his own company. So. I think an amazing journey, amazing story, and I can't wait to learn more. So welcome to the show, Dylan. Awesome, Neil. Thanks for having me, brother. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, uh, definitely uh, have a unique background following my passions from uh, burgers to video games. So I'm a professional big kid and uh, just kind of use that intuition to guide my path on entrepreneurship. But i uh, happy to dive into it more as we progress through the conversation. Awesome. Okay, so Dylan, as a visionary, what is the story that you want to bring to the world? The story that I want to bring to the world is that we are all in a stand, state of transformation. And one of the things that I'm very passionate in is both immersive technologies and personal transformation. And I believe that we are actually going through a unique era right now um, where we are slowly creating our own microcosms or realities. And as we all transform on our own personal journeys, we inspire other people on those paths. So I think what we're doing is we're slowly starting to digitize and gamify our world until we finally create the world of our own imaginations, using each other to transform each other into the better beings of who we want to be. That is an awesome answer. Uh, and there's a lot that I want to unpack there. So let's just talk about digitizing and gamifying what that means. Um, to if you could break that down for our audience to understand what that means. Sure. So in our lives, um, we go through a level of, uh, I follow a lot of the hero's journey. I'm also a virtual reality, augmented reality, and slightly in the artificial intelligence space um, as well. Now, Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey, you know, as, as I'm sure a lot of your readers know and people know, listeners, it's a lot about the uh, story of human transformation. That's what it is. It struggles, journeys, some sort of need. You come back changed and transformed, gathered in the Holy Grail along that path. Now, that story works well in story form. Right? You can listen, you can get the insights. The emotional intensity lays impact on you, and so it has an effect on you. The reason why we remember things is a experience along with intense emotion equals retention, right? So you get that from stories. Now from engagement, the other side of that, you get that from video games, or you get that from some sort of interactivity. It could be some sort of mental role playing. It could be, it could be uh, improv. It could be playing your favorite games. All those things are different types of interactive adventures that you are engaged with to level up. So you can, one, learn from other humans through mirror neurons or those types of activities, or you can actually learn from yourself or by doing certain types of activities. Now, those activities people have in their own heads, what I've defined as, well, not I define, but is termed as 
mental models. And so everyone is playing in their own mind, their own mental game, right? So for example, am I a good husband? Am I a good father? Uh, have I, am I a good citizen? Am I a degenerate that just plays at the base of my existence? We are all playing these mental models in their heads. Now, true champions, true people that are able to transform that are not only able to get what's in their head, they can get it down on paper, out into the reality. And the true uh, game changers, people like Tony Robbins or other ones, are so powerful, so resonant with their mental models that they can actually quantify and digitize that thing and overlay that so other people can basically have a roadmap or a path of where they want to get to. So you're, in effect, saying that, ironically, by tapping into the virtual world, we can actually improve our real world. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm saying uh, art inspires science, science inspires art. Uh, technology, I often said that um, entertainment has sold us a fantasy that technology tries to live up to. So hoverboards, 3D printing devices, VR headsets, these were all figments of our imagination that then through willpower and insights and inspirations, we've created science and technology to actually have it become a real thing, you know, as HAL 9000 would say. This is a circle of reality then? Is that what we're looking at? <laughs> yes, <laughs> entirely. <laughs> so going back to the hero's journey, which I love that metaphor. It's, it's wonderful. I think, uh, first, first of all, I agree with you. Uh, but it seems that if we're thinking about it in terms of the hero's journey, we're approaching or we're at the dark night of the soul. Would you say that's accurate? Or do you think that humanity has some way to go that we have further let's say using this metaphor to go down before we realize what we need to do to change personally. And then of course, change the world as a result of our personal transformation. You know, uh, stories change based on the perspective. So depending on where you're standing, the position of where we're at in this world is completely different. You know, uh, us all being very privileged people that live here in Southern California, you know, we have, even though we have this crazy pandemic, things are looking pretty good. In other places, it is a true war zone with no hope and no leaks. And that's why a lot of people, you know, try to make that crossing to the, to the netherworld over to here to see if they can actually make it so they can actually transform their own lives. I mean, that's the whole point of America was a place of transformation. If you're willing to work hard enough, leave your community, go on a growth path and level up, come to America where your dreams come true, right? So it just depends on where you're positioned and where you're at in this, in this current world. I guess, you know, given that we've been talking about the hero's journey and transformation, let's just pause for a second here. You know, we're, we're in the middle of COVID right now, and to some degree, we're all at least telepresence, if not virtually present. What, what do you think the next steps are? Because I, like, I look at schools and like, you know, the university, you know, Michael and I teach at different universities. And there's always this talk, well, one day we'll go, we'll probably be online, it'll be, but it's probably a ways away. And now we've made this sudden leap into having to do it. Now people are talking about, hey, this is actually working out pretty well. What's the, actually the next step? Is the next step to actually have like virtual classes? Yeah. Um, yeah, 100%. So being a virtuality developer and, you know, uh, you know, I got my start uh, originally back in, the Oculus headset on Kickstarter and it came in, put it on, and I had an experience where my mind was blown. I was like, oh wow, this is the future. There's so many things coming. And you know, being uh, early, at least from my generation in the space, there's other previous generations of virtuality enthusiasts that were basically uh, burnt out and you know, go through that trough of uh, disillusionment and all that stuff. Um, but you always feel as a virtuality developer that you're building a town um, in the desert saying the trains are coming. The trains are coming, I swear it's coming. I'm, burning, I'm building it right here. And, and a lot of people are naysayers until they experience, you know, what's possible, right? So a lot of times, you know, everybody wants to buy, but no one wants to be sold. So if you're trying to tell them, oh, what are the advantages of virtual reality? It's, it's very much trying to like beat someone over the head with the reality say, look, I can't, I, I can't try to convince you about this um, for, for various reasons until you actually experience what's possible, right? So a lot of virtual reality developers already knew what's possible. And a lot of people have already, you know, digitize themselves to a degree and put themselves into the computer system to various various degrees right so you know even right now you know if you want to have a presence online you have to cut off a piece of your soul put it online you got to invest time willpower energy to get that in there and even you know if you think about this people that die their souls are still attached into this reality um one year ago today my father passed away um and it's odd 
uh, as I was looking through some things, um, I could look through the text messages of our communication today. I could look over and I could see his Facebook messages. I could see comments and posts uh, tagging him in Facebook today. And you realize that that spirit, that essence still lives on. Now, where are we going with this? You know, it's, it, we are slowly becoming more and more merged with the system, right? Social media is one type of digitization of ourselves. Now you're going to the virtual era. It just merely, it's an embodiment of this social digital presence. We're, we're moving these, and there's already people that already spend most of their waking time in there. It doesn't even have to be in VR. You are living in the world of Warcraft and it's progressing upwards. So, you know, we are becoming more and more integrated into the digital age. All COVID did was basically, it was like a mama bird kicking the babies out of the nest, figuring us how to fly along the way. That's what's happening with this thing. It's already happening. People are already doing it. The only reason people don't believe it, it's like lights going on at night in the city. You, they don't turn on all at once. They all go off one by one. One light is definitely on, but it's just taking a while till eventually they'll all be on together. And so that's where we're going to eventually, you're gonna look backwards and realize, yeah, when did this happen? It's a series of grays, it's a luminary period. And it's just gonna be slowly transitioning over time until finally it just is the new norm. I think you put that very well. Uh, I think also for a lot of people, the book Ready Player One, as well as the movie was a big uh, awakening as to the, the potentials of virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And you have a really good metaphor when you're talking about the city lights coming on in this immersion phenomenon. So if you could paint us a picture of what this looks like five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now of what you are seeing based on the, the trajectory that you're envisioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, a couple things, the farther you go out, the less accurate you're going to be. So you know, it's so easy. Like we did this six months ago and I'm like, there's a giant pandemic coming. You all say I'm crazy. Right. But now it just makes sense. Right. right. Right now we're having to connect digitally. So it just makes sense because again, much like the VR headsets, everyone wants to buy, nobody wants to be sold until you experience it. You know, we're all acting from a place of ignorance. Right. And so, you know, I, to my best guess from the, the things that I've experienced so far, I mean, if you look at the trajectory of people slowly digitizing themselves. There is value add for themselves to become online. There's gonna give you more of a value add for them to put themselves into the matrix for lack of a terminology. And so what I see in the future is, you know, a oasis type of experience, a place where everyone is basically creating their own mini realities where they share with each other, which is what is a Facebook page, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is an Instagram page? You are cultivating this digital reality that you are trying to mold and express with the world. Um, we were going to be blending together other pieces of technology. So very much like how it's not just a wheel or an engine or, you know, a, a car is a sum of the parts together, you know, VR and AI uh, combined with other types of technologies. We're basically digitizing everything to where when you look at a person, it's not just that person. It is the history of that person is the total sum of that averages. It is AI analyzing that. And it's also a mirror reflecting back into itself you are not only learning and growing with the AI VR technology, but it's inspiring that back and forth development. So you become quicker and get spun down that cycle to where the iteration of the technology becomes so fast that, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> 12 months worth of technical innovation happens in a week and a day and that. And so finally that cycle spinning so quickly, um, you know, it's just innovation has happened where it's just the acceptable norm and just everyone is just used to flux and change. So that's why I say what's going to happen. Just constant change. I, you know, when we're talking about the future, I have to ask, right? Because you kind of alluded to, you know, we're moving towards maybe at least a digital immortality here, mm -hmm. talking about the future. One of my favorite movies is Tron, which I think is the ultimate form of extended reality. When do we get there? <laughs> it's coming, man. The question B is like, I mean, how much do you need to not be connected to the, you know, how much do you, what senses do you need to have be put in there, right? And so... You know, right now, if you look at, we have five senses-ish uh, going on, we've been able to pretty much digitize two of them, right? We're pretty solid at visual and auditory. Smelling sucks, but people do it. Tastes also. Uh, haptics, we're halfway good at, right? There's some things, the sense of touch. So we're, you know, say close to halfway through digitizing all those senses. Now, this is a linear progression over time to a degree, right? So what happens when Elon Musk brings out Neuralink, plugs it into the brain, and now you can st save states, right? So I can, you know, literally have that whole altered, altered carbon kind of thing go on, lock it into your brain, and then, you know, you can save your state, upload a new bean, have the same intellect, same everything. So 
it depends on, again, since I haven't experienced Neuralink, I haven't had it plugged in my brain, the, the merging the computer with the brain interface along with VR, AR, and AI all blends together. There's actually this awesome chick named uh, Mary Lou. Um, are you guys familiar with Mary Lou? Have you seen them? No? I don't think I am, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Mary Lou was one of the head researchers for the Oculus Facebook Labs. Um, super brilliant chick. I was wandering the back alleys of Reddit, 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, off doing, you know, disreputable things. And I came across this uh, uh, post that says, woman invents uh, AR, VR, telepathy at Oculus Labs. So I was like, oh, it's fascinating. So she is an, a, a very powerful woman. Um, and it, a lot of the conversation was even a bit over my head. So I had to send the conversation to three of my smartest friends going, hey, I'm not, I'm not smart enough to figure this thing out. Let me know if this is legit. And so what she was saying essentially was this. Um, technology right now has gotten so good um, that an MRI machine, right, which is we know how big and heavy and expensive those types of things are, the cameras on your phone are so powerful that you can actually remove the filters, and if you hold it up to your scalp, it can measure the blood that flows through it. So she actually, at the Oculus Facebook Labs, took an array, multiple cameras, and put it inside a headset, and then put it on your brain. And so if they had this very, very expensive AR, VR unit that would allow you to toggle between the augmented reality and virtual reality, as well as have these camera sensors on your head. What does that mean? You're basically hooked up to an MRI machine at the same time you're going through AR, VR. So what happens, and I'm sure Neil can expound on this, <laughs> when you take an, if you take something that's measuring your brain, brain flow, looking at your auditory and visual sensors, and you're measuring that not only for an hour, not only for a day, but for weeks and years on end that people are be spending in virtuality. And not only that, you're looking at big data being shared over large networks, communications, dialogues, text messages. You're going to go from not only being able to measure and tweak, but to the third phase of artificial intelligence, which is predictive analytics, which is what allows her, she said, is going to be possible to measure your brainwaves, translate that into communication, and digitally send that to someone else that can then get input into their own brain. So AR, VR, telepathy at a distance. She's since uh, left uh, Oculus Labs and she started her own company using this technology. That's fascinating. In fact, uh, I think we need to get her on the show. Um, but to go back to, you talked about Tron. We talked about Ready Player One. Um, I'm reminded of another movie that people talk about a lot when it comes to the hero's journey. So I want to present another, uh, another aspect of this. So if you remember from... Uh, Star Wars, I'm talking about episodes four, five, and six, a big mention w was made to Luke that it was important to him as part of his hero's journey to not submit to the system, to not submit to the machine, right? And so, but what I hear you're talking about is really a merging of uh, machine and humanity, especially when we're talking about things like Neuralink, we're talking things about like telepathy. How do you reconcile these two ideas where, because you also have talked about the soul, um, where do you believe that this is our destiny to, in a sense, merge with the with these technologies, or are these providing us uh, a choice where we need to then go further into our humanness and to go a different route? How how do you view this? The greatest thing about life's game, it's all a choice, right? So for millennia, we've been, you know, hunter gatherers. We have been um, collaborative with our ecosystem, right? We have been, you know moving through it, adapting to it. Um, that was a choice for a long time. Since then, we, we have chosen another path, and that is to dominate our environment, to, to dominate and then to basically use, which is our greatest superpower, the ability to collaborate with each other and technology to dominate places. So if you look at any successful culture, any successful civilization, any successful company, their ability to collaborate with each other using technology is the dominant force that allows them to get the upper hand over anybody else. If you, if you look at originally when homo sapiens were out in Africa, right? if you look at their trajectory, they left Africa originally and they started moving their ways up through the continents. They came across the Neanderthals 
who kicked the crap out of them. They then got knocked all the way back to Africa about three to 500 years later, I believe. Uh, this is actually in the book Sapiens. They actually figured some stuff out and they came back with their ability to collaborate and cooperate, you know, not just smaller tribes, but hundreds or thousands of them. And then they just beat Neanderthals to a, you know, the nothingness. I actually have 4% Neanderthal in my genes are, or so 23 and me says. Now, we dominated that space. And so we get our butts kicked, but our magic ability is our ability to learn. But the only issue is without technology, it's, it's finite. It just, or it, it just, it, it, it's temporary. It disappears. So I learn it. So one of the original technologies was AKA stories. We take those stories. We share the communications. Don't go into those woods. Tiger eats you. Oh, remember that? That sticks, right? Why do people say God bless you after you sneeze? Do you, do you know why people say that? Uh, well, I heard that it was because the devil was supposed to enter your soul during that moment in time, but that was that could be wrong. Close. Um, it, that's also true. Uh, the other one being is the fact that uh, in the Black Plague era, uh, fits of sneezing, sneezing was the first signs that you actually had the Black Plague. So if you sneeze, they say, God bless you. The reason being is you're probably going to die. Now, how long ago was that? That lesson was so powerful, so intense that we do it today and we don't even understand why, right? That's the power of the lessons in the story in mankind. Now, why is the technology you're asking me? Well, here's the issue is that we're in an arms race against ourselves. We are competing with our own selves. Now, if we were all like, you know, you know, okay, ecosystems, all that stuff, and we would, we would go off and live our own lives, but we're not, that's not our style. Our, our style is progress. What we, what humans crave more than anything is progress and growth. And so we've been using technology to get a leg up against, you know, the world and ourselves since then. So I don't see the arms race for technology slowing down. The question is, can we use the technology in a way that actually allows us to become integrated parts of our civilization? So with that, it's very difficult to tell. If you look at the last thing I'll say is technology is nothing more than magnification, magnification of the human will. So I take a knife, I can cut bread, take a knife, I can cut you. What you do with the technology, it's, it's really for us to, you know, if we can figure out what we're doing um, and hopefully steer it towards utopia, not disaster, um, then that would be a beautiful thing. But, you know, time is yet to tell. Well, you're, you're touching upon, I think, a really key point, right? That it's all about tools, technology, whether it's VR, AI, whatever, it's a tool at the end of the day. And while it gives us advantages, it can create some drawbacks. How do we get into the mindset that we focus on, you know, advancing our story or changing the story for good um, rather than using it for, I'll call it corrupt purposes? Yeah. Uh, well, that's creating, um, that's basically creating a, a system, a gamification that supports um, positive progress and diminishes negative progress. So right now, you know, we, you know, we moved from the hunter-gatherer era, which had its own issues, uh, to the agricultural area, which had other types of issues, right, to this industrial area where we left. And as we made progress, we lost pieces, but we also gained pieces. We traded off, you know, certain things that we had um, for other types of trade-offs. And as we're going through this area of technology, the question is, what games are we playing, right? In the US, it's the game of money. It's the game of selfishness. I want to succeed. I want to win. I want to dominate at all costs. That right there has certain you know, advantages and disadvantages. And so do we allow that system to be supported or do we create another type of game, another type of infrastructure, another type of system that says, look, that is not entirely tolerable. Um, you know, we look at money and say, okay, that costs $50 for a pair of Nikes. What we don't really understand is what is the true cost of Nikes? We don't take all the suffering of the kids in the factories. We don't take all the pollution, the water and the air. All we look is like, selfishly, I'm going to go to Walmart and I'm going to buy the cheapest pair of Nikes. I don't care who suffered. I don't care that, you know, the pigs were boiled in the water first so that and they're alive, I like to make my food. I, I don't care. All I want is the cheap, cheapest pair of Nikes possible, right? And that's be, it's because it's very – people are abstracting out all that pain and suffering and just giving you it at the smallest cost possible. But since we don't feel it, you know, it's why are, why are the negative comments online? Why is YouTube one of the most horrendous places to ever read feedback? That is, it seems like the most, if you read, if, if, if I was an alien and I just looked at YouTube comments, I would think we were nothing but racist, ignorant, mean, evil people. 
right? And that's because it is super hard to hate up and close. It's very difficult for you to read those YouTube comments while looking into my eyes and my soul because we have social situations that forces us to not allow that. But when someone is anonymous and they pop into a system, they go, whatever evil thing that pops in their head because I'm just a pumped up nine-year-old who's on way too much Coca-Cola. Like It's so easy to hate at a distance. So the question is, can we create some of those social standards, some of those, some, some of those environmental things that say, look, all we accept here is, you know, we want you to be your best self, but we also want you to be kind to other people. Can you, can you make progress? Can you grow? Can you level up? Can you transform without hurting someone else? The difference, what you're describing right here, is the difference between a hero and a villain. A hero is someone with great power who is of service to the people. A business, a great business does this, right? A villain has great power who keeps other people suppressed so that they can keep their own selfish ways. That's the difference between a dictator and a leader, right? So if you look at that, it's how do you set up the system to win so that you make more leaders and not so many dictators? That's a, a perfect segue to a, the final question that we want to ask you today. You said this term a few times and I love it because there's a video game connotation, but it sounds like there's a spiritual connotation as well. This term leveling up. So I'd like you to help explain what that means and how each of us can begin to level up in our daily lives. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of different ways to level up, however you want to play your game, right? So there's all these little micro games that people play, you know, uh, the quality of my singing, the quality of my character, you know. So um, what I would recommend for people that would like to level up is first you have to understand that you're playing a game, right? And in order to understand that, you know, one of the first steps you can do is, you know, write your stuff down. What are, who are your avatars, right? Um, you know, Neil is not only master AI, UN, overall G, he's also a father. He's also a husband. He has many different avatars that he wears in a day-to-day -day basis. Some are at different levels. Um, I don't know his different levels, but my guess is he knows or the people that are close to him knows. So my recommendation would be for people that want to level up is to first understand the avatars that they represent and then map a path, a mental model to a mentor that they idolize, someone who actually has that ability, and then follow that path, right? So, you know, if I wanted to become a part of the UN, there's probably some sort of path from where I'm at right now to, you know, you know, helping Neil or, or something along that path. So getting clear on the, you know, your current avatar status of what are those character types and then understanding who is that person that you want to be, what is that ultimate avatar, and then using your mental model, AKA why we actually like the hero's journey story in the first place to follow that path and tell what stage of this journey am I on, right? Am I getting my butt kicked? Well, maybe I need a mentor to give me special tools and abilities. Am I, if I, am I so leveled up that right now um, I'm actually going to be a mentor? So I'm going to reach out to people younger than me and I'm going to put out that vibe and go, hey, uh, young Timmy, I used to also not know anything about virtual reality. Let me paint you a path so that you can go on your progress because, you know, depending on where you're at, it depends on, you know, what you need to do to level up. Well, fantastic, Dylan. On that note, if people out there want to learn how they can level up, how they can help change this, their story, how can they get a hold of you? How can they learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, uh, rocking. Um, so uh, you can email me, uh, Dylan, D-Y-L-A-N, at realitysmash.com. Um, I also have a podcast called Heroes of Reality, uh, heroesofreality.com, uh, where we interview heroes in life, technology, and business um, all around the gamification and the progress of mankind. So um, they can they can follow me there. They can hit me up on an email. Um, I you know I love to help people and paint the path for them if possible. And uh, yeah, so you know thank you so much, Neil, Michael. I really appreciate this. This has been fun, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, listening to some more of your stories as they change along the path. Thank you. Hey, thank fantastic. You. Thanks for being Thanks. on the show today. You got it, brothers. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Hey, if you like today's show, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment. If you've been enjoying the Changing the Story podcast series, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you.